Canonically, the Nebulon B was supposed to be an Imperial vessel before it was a Rebel vessel, but the Nebulon B looks nothing like other Imperial ships. So I thought with just the right approach, I could design what the original Nebulon B might have looked like in Imperial service. Assuming that the Rebel version is a highly modified and stripped down version. When you look at a Nebulon B, it shares virtually nothing with the immediately recognizable design language of the Empire, and specifically vehicles produced by Kuat Drive Yards. But when I look at the Nebulon B as it appears in Rebel service, I immediately see the telltale signs that this ship has seen significantly better days. Honestly, this whole forward section looks almost like it's been ripped off completely, perhaps evidence that in its prior days, this section might have been more substantial. And this glaringly spindly midsection looks more like a fully exposed keel than it does an intentional design choice. Finally, the forward section of the aft engine block looks almost like we're seeing exposed deck lines, like an entire middle section has been ripped out. And when you start to fill in the gaps suggested by these telltale signs, a much more robust totalitarian shape emerges, a proper imperial warship. This is the Nebulon B, fully realized and in its prime. Canonically, this vessel is equipped with 12 turbo lasers, 12 laser cannons, and holds a full squadron of TIE fighters in its hangar bay. Now, the Rebel Nebulon B has always been a mystery as it pertains to fighters. Numerous sources describe it as having hangar bays, but it simply does not. And its only hope is to dock ships along its spindly midsection. When I tackled my interpretation of an Imperial Nebulon B, I knew I had to come up with a hangar system, and I thought I could solve two problems with the ship at once, by adding the hangar to the midsection and consequently bulking up that dreaded weak point. With the help of my friend Angelos Carterinus, we were able to design a formidable hangar system, one that could hold a squadron of TIE fighters, multiple auxiliary crafts, and could even land a Lambda shuttle. Of course, the hangar system is a little small and cramped by Imperial standards, but I'll cover that as I talk about some of the lore that I developed for this ship. In my mind, the Nebulon was ordered by the Empire as few as five years after the conclusion of the Clone Wars as an alternative to the Architens class, whose deficiencies in armament and fighter craft were highlighted by the fact that it often needed to enter combat as part of a battle group, relying on Gozanti class cruisers to provide most of its fighter support. The Nebulon project would improve on and combine the best elements of both ships. It was more streamlined and more heavily armed than an Architens and could hold three times times as many starfighters as a Gozanti, which without its fighter complement was virtually useless in a fight. The Nebulon, with a full squadron of starfighters and relatively heavy armament, could in theory go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a much larger vessel. But the Nebulon's development was plagued by upsets. As first realized, the Nebulon lacked most of the forward blade section and housed much of its personnel forward of the hangar bay. This arrangement proved less than ideal as the hangar facilities were considered much too small Small, mostly being dedicated to tightly packed TIE fighters and affording no space to shuttles, bombers, or any visiting craft. To make matters worse, the single dorsal aperture made simultaneous launch and retrieval a logistical nightmare. Tragically, Kuat engineers discovered one final flaw too late. In the Alpha prototype of the Nebulon, vertical concussion missile launch systems were positioned between the crew facilities and the forward end of the hangar bay. During an ill-fated high-speed TIE retrieval drill, an explosion on the flight deck chain reacted to the launch systems, blasting the ship apart at a critical weak point. Needless to say, the Nebulon A was scrapped within a year, and a new model was drafted, the Nebulon B, which reinforced the weak point and enlarged the forward blade section. This allowed crew facilities to be moved from the midsection and freed up space for an expanded hangar system. Now a squadron of ties could be stored relatively comfortably and out of the way, with space to spare for additional craft. This expanded the expanded hangar system was incredibly lavish for a ship as relatively small as the Nebulon B, and it was equally complex, representing the most sophisticated TIE storage and launching mechanisms in the fleet. In just 2,500 square 
meters, the Nebulon B could service 12 standard TIE fighters and as many as six twin hulled TIE variants, such as the TIE bomber and the TIE shuttle, and still had 700 meters to spare for an open hangar. This facility was specifically designed to accommodate ships as large as the Lambda shuttle, which, while stylish and elegantly imposing, were notoriously difficult to dock inside smaller frigates and light cruisers. And even though the Nebulon B could accommodate a Lambda shuttle, any sufficiently large craft landed in the hangar would need to be launched again in short order to keep flight lines clear, but long-term docking facilities were available on the underside of the ship for these sorts of circumstances. But for all the fighters and firepower that Kuat engineers could pack into the Nebulon, the project was doomed from the beginning. The Nebulon was ordered in a time when complete Imperial rule was more of a dream and less of a certified reality. In practice, the Empire was quite popular on some worlds, and it was militarily overpowering on the rest, meaning that the regime had virtually no difficulty enforcing its rule, and complete ownership of a galaxy of resources and personnel meant that the Imperial Star Destroyer once envisioned as the ultimate pinnacle of the Starfleet, was rapidly becoming the standard ship of the line. By the time that the Nebulon was entering service, the demand for smaller, more versatile ships was simply not great enough to justify such an expensive and complicated vessel as the Nebulon B. Ultimately, the Empire would continue to use battle groups of Clone Wars era Architens and Gozantes for close to 15 years, but almost all of these aging ships were deployed in relatively sparsely populated systems. Many of the completed Nebulon B units never entered service and remained in storage at Kuat facilities for years. Several years before the Battle of Yavin, a cell of the fledgling Rebel Alliance undertook a mission to capture an orbital boneyard containing several uncommissioned Nebulon B frigates. While Intel suggested that these ships were completely spaceworthy, the reality was that these ships had been completely picked over. The nearby shipyard had been scavenging them for components for years, repurposing many, if not most, of their supplemental systems for the production of Star Destroyers. What the Rebels found were mere skeletons, and many were completely non-functional. Still, the Rebels took the opportunity and managed to abscond with an unspecified number of the vessels. The Rebels would go on to trade these around to different cells to do with as they pleased. Some were completely dismantled, and their parts were used to modify existing ships or to build planet-side structures, and other cells would undertake huge projects to return some of these Nebulons to a functional status. Unfortunately, even the most salvageable Nebulon B frigates were hardly comparable to the formidable Imperial warships that they had been in their past lives. Consequently, some of these restored Nebulon Bs were repurposed for other roles, such as hospital or logistical vessels. But even so, the Nebulon B appeared, much to the Empire's surprise, at several major engagements, solidifying the Nebulon B as a symbol of the Rebellion. But there you have it, a full breakdown and a little bit of the lore behind my interpretation of what the Nebulon B looked like in its prime. This was a super fun project to undertake, and I would love to explore other vessels that are technically canonical, but have never appeared in any visual medium. So if you have suggestions for ships that I could do, I would love to hear them. I would also like to take a moment to thank my friend Angelos Cardarinus, who was instrumental in fleshing out the hangar facilities of this ship, which are, in my opinion, some of the coolest aspects, and I'm super happy that I could show those off. Angelos is also responsible for all the original renders that you see in this video. He has a knack for making my ships look incredibly beautiful, and I can't thank him enough for helping to make this ship really pop in this video. These videos are a massive investment of time and creative energy. It easily took three weeks to design, model, texture, and render this ship. And if you want to support projects like these so that it continues to remain viable to make them, it would mean so much to me if you considered supporting me on Patreon. It's incredible how much of a difference just one contribution can make, let alone when some 150 of you come together to support my work. That's amazing. Thank you guys so much. I literally couldn't do this without you. And to the rest of you, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.